Good afternoon. Um, I want to thank you for joining me. Um, if you've been joining me on a regular basis, you know every Wednesday I've been holding a town hall right here on Facebook and Zoom and CCTV with the incredible support of CCTV. I want to say thank you to them as always. Um, we started these town meetings six or seven weeks ago to really provide an opportunity for our residents um, to be able to ask questions and really learn more about how this pandemic um, has, is affecting our lives and, and what it means about where we are today and, and how do we start planning to safely um, continue to live our lives tomorrow and plan for the future. For those of you who've been personally impacted by uh, COVID-19 and this pandemic, I wanna say I'm sorry. I'm sorry for the loss of security and the loss of life that maybe you've experienced this time. Um, for those of you who've been able to stay at home and really shelter in place, I wanna say thank you. You are helping to save lives every day. Every time we choose not to make an unnecessary trip out with the possibility of either spreading um, this, this virus or catching it, we are saving lives and we are certainly saving um, lives for those on the front lines who every day are working to save lives at great risk to their own. Um, and for those of you who continue to understand the importance of face covering, um, I know it's not comfortable, um, it's not fun, and it's as the weather gets hotter, it's gonna be more uncomfortable. Um, but I wanna say thank you, because whenever you wear a mask, you're protecting someone else. Um, and in this together, really, this is this pandemic has shown us we have no other place to go but to turn to each other. If we don't turn to each other and we don't support each other, it really is at our own peril. So um, we're in this together, and I've got some pretty amazing people who really know firsthand what it means to be in the, to this to be in this together, and who are working really hard to make sure that we are meeting the needs of of our community members, um, and that we're doing the really the proper planning of what it means to continue to be able to live our lives safely navigate the economic security of our lives while also understanding that we have an obligation to the public health. So at this time, I would like to thank um, my guests for joining me and I'm gonna ask, I'm gonna introduce them and ask them to say a little bit. Um, but this, today we're talking about what is this four phase opening of the economy that Governor Baker rolled out this past Monday. Um, I'm still digesting some of what that means myself and I think many of you have had a lot of questions I think we had more questions emailed to us ahead of it uh, than any other town meeting on this one, which just says that people are confused and hungry and really want um, facts and information. So um, I wanna start by first, I wanna acknowledge and thank my colleague, um, Representative Ann Margaret Ferrante. Um, Ann Margaret is the um, joint, she's the chair on the economic development and new emerging technologies for the legislature. And boy, is that playing an important role right now as we try to reimagine how do we actually live our lives and what does a new economy look like and what does it require? Um, I also wanna thank you representative for you were the house appointee for the reopening of this, this advisory committee. But I think it's really important that people know while you were appointed by the speaker at the invitation of the governor, we did not actually have an opportunity to participate in this committee. So you were invited to observe and to listen, but um, the legislature was not asked or allowed to provide input in the advisory report that we heard on Monday. So I wanna thank you for playing this really key role um, and knowing that, that it'll be very helpful to where we kind of forge ahead now. We're also joined by um, Jody Sugarman Brosen. I wanna thank you. Jody is the president and executive director of MassCosh. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And, um, and um, really there's no better organization that um, your, your sole purpose is to make sure that you are the, um, the eyes and the ears and the well-being of workers throughout the country and certainly here in Massachusetts um, and making sure that as the economy opens up that primary, you have no economy without workers and your role is to make sure that they are safe and, and um, protected in doing their job, which ultimately protects the rest of us. I also wanna say uh, thank you to um, our city manager, Louis de Pasquale. You're getting better at this Zoom every time I see you here. I can see all of your face. I'm so proud of you. Um, uh, thank you for everything you're doing, and I'm joined by you and Claude Alex Jacob, who is our, um, essentially he is our public health commissioner. I think we'll see his face hopefully soon. Um, Claude and Louis, you guys have a really tough job here because your job is to interpret what these regulations mean, make sure you actually understand what this phasing of the opening up looks like, and to enforce them. And I know that so far it's not been an easy job. 
um, and it's been really confusing. And um, my hope is that as we open, that we will have more concise and consistent and universal direction for you guys. So you're not left between um, residents, businesses, and the state and trying to figure out you know, where to move. And I know you guys have been working really hard. So I wanna say thank you. Um, I'm gonna start with a question for my colleague because she know, uh, she, she, I, I'm, so, I'm so grateful that she was able to jump onto this call. Um, there are people in your life that you know, like just get the work done and they are all about like just doing the work and helping people. And if you know my colleague, Representative Ann Margaret Ferrante, you know that she's a worker. You know what drives her. It's her ability to help people and to just get things done that help people. So um, I wanna thank you for your time, for your work, but I'm just so grateful to be in the world with you because we need more of you um, than we have currently. So thank you for being you. And can you just tell us what your experience was on being a, an observer of um, the reopening of the governor's advisory? What was that like? What are your thoughts and where do you think this leaves us? So first, let me say thank you for your kind words. Um, I think my face is probably matching the color in my shirt right now. Oh. Uh, that would be true right in person, you're right. You're natural, to that. natural blush, right? You have some natural blush now. Um, but um, no, it's a, it's a pleasure to be here with you. And, and likewise, I consider us to be in the, the same category of representative that um, digs into the work and wants to make sure that the work gets done well so that we're able to put our constituents in a, in a better position, even in trying times like this when we're confronted with the first pandemic in the, in the last century. And so thank you for having me here. Um, as Marjorie said, um, our role, the legislature's role, was one more of observer to the process, to make sure that we understood and could appreciate the process that was unfolding and be able to know where uh, issues were going to be. And, and I think it's important uh, to remember the executive branch uh, has its role to promulgate uh, regulations moving forward, especially in a pandemic, but it's the legislature's role to review those regulations and to make sure that it's working. And so that's pretty much uh, the position that we're in now. The governor has had his opportunity to come forward, forward with his administration with uh, regulations for reopening. And, and as those go forward, we will continue to monitor them. Somebody asked me and said, um, is the work of the advisory board and the legislature complete now that the regulations are out? And I wanna stress to everybody who's watching this, uh, no, the work is not complete. We will continue to monitor every, monitor every day, uh, take in public input and sift through that uh, public input. What was most interesting is um, the idea, I, I likened it to, I'm an attorney, I likened it to watching a jury deliberation uh, in terms of the people who were on the task force. We heard uh, roughly um, 70 to 75 presentations um, from various sectors of the economy, including healthcare, including childcare, including employers, uh, including labor groups. And um, it was very interesting to see how all of those uh, test, all of that testimony interwove with, um, with the others. It was also very interesting to see that under uh, this particular pandemic, in this particular moment, what the stress fractures, I like to call them stress fractures, they're not complete breaks, but they are stress fractures where the legislature is going to have to act in order to help uh, the economy and uh, society move forward with the reopening. And so, you know, one good example of that is childcare. I think if you talk to anybody who's involved in a small business right now, I'm not talking about corporate America, but I'm talking about small mom and pop businesses. They will tell you that they're completely rethinking their model of how, whether they're a coffee shop, whether they're a restaurant, whether they're a personal services salon, whatever they are, they need to think about um, how they're going to do business differently. And if you think of staggered shifts, and if you think of different hours, and if you think of um, people only, customers only entering that workplace um, during specific times and appointment only, and only one person at a time, it, it really becomes clear that we're gonna have to 
as a legislature think about our delivery of child care services and how that works. And so um, it's a it's a progress in it's it's a process in motion. Um, hopefully, we'll make some progress. I know that there are some people who think we're uh, the governor's opening too quickly. I know that there are some people who are uh, down and depressed because they're afraid that we'll never get back to a new normal. Um, and you know, hopefully, as we were uh, with the administration, we're going to find and strike that balance of offering people hope for a better tomorrow and, and a return to a, a new normal. Um, one last thing that I want to say, Marjorie, is the other thing that impressed me about this process is going into it, I had a fear, even as the House Chair of Economic Development, I had a fear that this was going to be an employer-driven process. And so I didn't want to see a process that was um, put forward and designed ultimately by economic reward in return on investment, because that would be a horrible thing if we sacrificed public health uh, just for economic gain. And so I was pleasantly surprised, and I have a lot of uh, admiration for Dr. Monica Burrell, who is the Commissioner of Public Health. Uh, she is a professional, she is intelligent, she is knowledgeable, she seeks every day to increase that knowledge, she works with the um, a team of dedicated healthcare professionals that are world renowned because we're fortunate enough to have the hospitals that we do. And her group is the group that drives the decision making on uh, what will open up, when it will open up, and how it will open up. And so I just want to share that because, again, when you hear reopening advisory board, it sounded like that collection. Uh, of people who are making the decisions on when to open, how to open, but it, but it's not. It is truly the medical uh, professionals. Uh, Representative, thank you. I think that that's a really important point that has maybe not gotten enough attention. Um, and I, I, like you, have an enormous amount of respect for Dr. Burrell, having worked with her in my capacity as chair of the um, Mental Health and Substance Use and Recovery. So I really, that has been for me the bright light, knowing that we have really competent public health people who are helping to also lead the way on this. But thank you for your work on this. And then I guess I'll turn to, before I ask my, my, my colleagues in the city, what this looks like for them. Um, I also have um, Jody. You know, I, Mass Kosh had some really strong um, opinions, and 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 I believe they they gave the governor a, a failing grade on sort of how they rolled this out. And to just you know um, to share with people when they announced that this advisory committee was coming into formation, like many people, I was shocked to see that there wasn't somebody who represented a worker's point of view on this. And I did have a conversation with the Lieutenant Governor, I called her up on a Friday night, and we talked about it. Um, she assured me that they would be, in, they would be informing the process. Um, I did not leave that conversation still feeling good that you would have a table with stakeholders and not put um, a worker representative at the table. Why bother having the table? And I specifically said, um, and, and Jody, this is the first time you and I have actually met. Um, I know your work, but I said, you know, what about Mass Kosh? Like put Mass Kosh on this so that there's credibility and, and more importantly, there's confidence that as we start to phase open the economy, that in addition to this being guided by public health, that those who we rely on to do the work will actually have been at the table and feel comfortable and quite honestly be able to help be ambassadors of explaining what this looks like. So I think the point about public health driving this is something that has been lost um, because there's so many questions and concerns about other parts of this. So that is important. But if you could tell me um, what Mass Cautious was, was response was to um, this advisory um, report. Thank you so much. Um, thank you, Representative Decker. Thank you, Representative Ferrante, for, for having me here today and your leadership on these issues. We really appreciate being uh, able to work with you both on issues uh, of, for workers. And, you know, I think one of the things that's important to talk about is the fact that we know and understand that a key way that this virus is being contracted and spread to the community is through workplace exposure, especially through essential workers. So understanding how to keep workers safe is a key way to provide prevent the virus from spreading. So we, we think about that a lot. Um, we were very concerned that there were no labor or workers groups at the table. Um, it, even legislators <laughs> were in an obs observatory 
position. So that was very concerning. And we think the results of the plan uh, showed that. And one of the key things that we've been calling for are enforceable health and safety standards to protect workers. Frankly, essential workers who have been in the workplace for the last eight weeks, nine weeks, they are getting sick by the thousands. They are even dying. We failed to protect those workers who are currently working. They are spreading the virus through their exposure. And we need and we wanted to see very strong enforceable standards. The workplace health and safety standards that the governor put out in his plan on Monday are a good start. And the phased approach is a good start but they only address certain kinds of exposure and they rely heavily on workers to change their behavior. And they also provide no real way for strong, robust enforcement. The entities that are meant to enforce the plan are the Massachusetts Department of Labor Standards, which has 12 inspectors for the entire state and partnership with the local boards of health. We expect that there are going to be a lot of issues as this rolls out. Um, and also there were no additional resources given to either the local boards of health or the Department of Labor Standards to be able to support enforcement. Nothing for inspections, nothing for compliance assistance for small businesses, none of that, no additional resources were provided, which is very problematic and is something that is um, really going to mean it'll be challenging for us to really ensure that these standards are followed. It also relies on workers to make complaints or customers. I read through the entire plan, tried to read the little posters on, on there. I didn't see a number anywhere for workers to call and make that complaint. Fortunately, Attorney General Mara Healy's office really stepped up today. They announced that they have a new hotline or that their, their Fair Labor Division hotline, but they have a new complaint form specifically so that workers can have one place that they know to submit a complaint. And the other issue that this plan really relies on workers to make these complaints, but has no protection for them from retaliation, which we know is happening quite a bit for those who are speaking up to report unsafe conditions. So we had a number of problems. Um, the other piece that's really missing from this is, uh, is really good occupational surveillance. And by that, I mean tracking the occupation, the industry, and the employer of, of those who get COVID-19. And that data is going to be really critical for us to be able to identify what, which workers are being impacted and to be able to intervene to protect them and also to identify workplace outbreaks so that we can address those right away. And frankly, also, we know that many essential workers are disproportionately represented, it, uh, are, people of color are disproportionately represented as essential workers. So the disproportionate impact of the virus on people of color has something to do with the work that they're doing as well. And we just, we really need that data. The plan does not call for any additional tracking um, and it does not um, provide for that either. Um, thank you. Uh, I think um, the fact that we've had, I think the highest number of COVID related um, incidences with workers in Massachusetts, I believe your office has been collecting that data is a real problem. So I think, you know, we move to sort of what it looks like for municipalities and especially in Cambridge. So there's a lot about this plan that seems really thoughtful, really well planned out. And then there's really big pieces that are missing. And this goes back to, for me with the administration, you know, avoid unnecessary headaches, right? It's so important that we just figure out how to do this right and get the work done. And that how you do that is determined by who's sitting at the table and so that you can actually really determine what are, so you know ahead of time, what are the issues that we know are gonna be problematic? And, and that was my push with the Lieutenant Governor, like you wanna know that now, you wanna know what those issues are gonna be now so that the good faith efforts so that we tried to work that out and incorporate that into the plan. But the good news is that the legislature does have oversight and we will be looking at this very carefully. And I know that you, that Mass Caution, the AFL-CIO, have really um, talked about the importance of the data collection and the impact of industry and understanding who's getting sick, which has a lot of ramifications um, and important information. So thank you for the work that you're doing. And then we have a lot of questions, but I'm going to um, talk to my, my, my city people here who I just, who's, who's holding all of us together um, because communities really have had to lead their, their communities. Um, if that, that makes sense, this has been, the state has given direction, but it's really been the municipalities 
that have had to decide how to drive home, how to keep their community safe and protected. So again, I wanna thank both our city manager and our public health commissioner, um, Claude Jacob. You guys have been, um, it's relentless and it's really, it, it is life and death. So there's not a whole lot of taking a break from this. And I appreciate that. Can you tell me what are, when, when you look at this plan, what are your concerns um, and, and what are your hopes and, and where do you think you're gonna need more support? And I can start with you, Mr. City Manager. So first of all, thank you for having us the opportunity to speak. So, well, I wanna first of all, thank the governor because one of the things he did recognize on this committee was the chief of staff from the mayor of Boston and the mayor of Lawrence and the mayor of East Hampton. Because the reality is it's the cities and towns who have to enforce and make sure things are going well. So to give us a voice, a voice was real important. And so that's the good news. But the one thing that we have stressed based on everything that's gone on is we need some lead time because it's very hard to enforce things that you're hearing the same day they're gonna open. And in, in this area, it was a little disappointing that all of a sudden this is placed upon us and now we're trying to catch up. And, and so that's one of the things that we've really tried to bring home the fact that we need to make sure we know how to enforce this, how we're gonna implement it. And you know, most cities, we're fortunate, we're a pretty large size city. So we have a large inspectional services department. We have a very talented and large health department, but for a lot of other places to try to really figure out how to implement and enforce these measures are close to impossible. And it's really challenging for us as well. So, but well, we've looked at it in all of these things and we've worked closely at all the decisions we make the health department's been involved and Clark can talk about their advisory task force, but we've taken a look working with the governor's plans all along to say, how does it affect Cambridge directly? Face mask coverings, we did it two days before the governor put out and we said, mandatory, whether you're six feet or not, you have to be in there and we've kept that. We got a notice golf courses are opening. We opened our, we're opening our golf course tomorrow, two weeks later, because we wanted more time to figure out how to do it, do it right. And it was amazing that when it came out, the nat went next with that same weekend, they changed it. And one of the things they changed is one of the discussions I had with Claude about how are we gonna handle this piece? So we take a look at this, we work slowly, and then we figure out the game plan. So I can tell you today, uh, through Councilor Simmons and the mayor and the health department and Claude was on it, we had a call with probably 50 of our faith community members to say, go slow. How can we help you? Can we work with you? Do you need face map? Are you opening? If you are open and hot, and the good news from what we heard today was nobody's rushing. That they understand the importance. We got to get this right. And when you bring a lot of people close together, even with the six foot this and all you hear about the singing and you know, we got to do it right. So we're pretty fortunate in Cambridge that we're with, with groups that understand the importance of going slow. So we had a very positive meeting today. We also sent sending out a letter today to our businesses that are scheduled to allow the 25% come the 25th to say, slow down. It's, we're not gonna tell you you can't do it, but please, we, we really, you don't want it either. You don't want all your employees back at the same time. So we're in this together. So continue to let people work at home. I can tell you we're not opening till June 1st. And that will be on a very limited level. And we're not even sure if we're gonna allow residents in our buildings. It needs to be slow, it needs to be right. Look, customer service, Marjorie will tell you, is my biggest concern, but safety has to be put ahead of that right now. And how we get that balance is so important, not just for our employees, but for the residents who are coming in for the service. So I think as we look at these things, as we move into phase two and phase three, the sooner we can find out what's going to happen so we can prepare for it, the better. Uh, you know, but like I said, we've been fortunate. We got out our letters to the business community asking about when they're bringing their people back. We met with the faith community today. We had our own construction guidelines. We closed constructions. Construction, when they said they could do it, we are actually now bringing a modified construction program back. It has more safety guidelines in there so we make sure we're covered so again it's a work in progress it's challenging because uh when guidelines come out and there is uncertainty it's why are you doing this other cities aren't and often one city reads it one way and another city reads it another way and another city reads it another way and it can get difficult i mean we had a real 
difficult time, to be very honest, with florists. We read the last deadline is they couldn't be open, and other cities interpreted it a little differently. And I can tell you, we had an incredible difficult time with our florist community, which we know was important, why we wouldn't let them open. But we read the guidelines and talked to the governor's office that said we couldn't. But it, it was an interpretation. So the other thing we said is, please, when you give out these guidelines, make sure that all the cities can understand it the same way. So it's not you read, read it one way, someone else reads it's another way. So these are the things that we're working on. But, you know, we've got a community that's really worked well together with us. And I, I'm going to turn it over to Claude, but I can tell you, I cannot thank Claude and his department enough because from day one, they have been a partner. They have been on top of this. And it's really good to have their expertise as we make these decisions. And Asad Say, who's the director of the Cambridge Health Alliance Commission, has also been involved. And it's a team approach, but it's a team approach based on, look, the economy is important. Getting back to work, opening restaurants is important. I understand that. I'm a finance person. But health safety has to continue to be a main, main reason. is because the worst thing that can happen is somehow, some way we're moving forward and everything gets shut down again. And that's the one balance we're trying to mix. So thank you. I'm going to just turn it over to Claude if that makes sense. Thank you, question, city Claude. manager, Deepa Squally. Oh, go ahead. So Claude, the question I guess I would have for you sure. is, and then, um, you know, we'll try to take one more question maybe from Representative Ferranti before she jumps off. But the question I have for you is, what is the balance and what guidance have you been given about monitoring the spikes in the virus as we slowly in, and, and through this phasing out, open up the economy? Um, you have this like very overwhelming role that I think, and unlike most communities, Cambridge has a robust public health department that is well-funded. That is not true for communities across Massachusetts. And I'm really worried for our, our, our colleagues and our, our neighbors across the state. So you have this role of interpretation, enforcement, and then keeping your eye on where the virus is, because ultimately the virus is dictating this. Um, and, and the science and our ability to, to test and trace and to contain. Um, so where, where you sit, how do you see this reopening and, and how do you weave in sort of what it looks like to monitor the virus? Thank you, Representative Decker, for that question. Just want to make sure that I can um, at least uh, bid you greetings from the fantastic team at the health department. So thanks for your support. Um, and just picking up on the comments by the city manager, but also to answer your question, just to put into context. Uh, so we are, by scale, the second largest local health department here in Massachusetts. Um, but compared to other health departments across the country, we're itty bitty. Um, we are required to be agile. Uh, this has always been a distance race. We're now in the ninth full week of this response effort. So multitasking is at a premium. Uh, managing wear and tear on the ground, I don't have to tell you what that looks like. Between our public health nurses, and we are fortunate enough that we have disease detectives, we have epidemiologists on staff, uh, although we're still under-resourced, but that's the skill set that looks at the patterns of what we're seeing from day to day, from week to week, from month to month. So I would say to your point, yes, we are expected to do a lot. Be the chef, cook, and bottle washer. We are um, a resource. Uh, I see our stock value going up in terms of our connection with community residents, community partners. But at your core, there's a lot that we've taken on, but it's been manageable. We've been trying to pace this out. Uh, to put in the context, we've had over 900 cases confirmed here in the city. We've had 80 residents um, who have perished, who have died from this virus. Um, we have over 100 individuals who have been hospitalized that have been reported to us. On the flip side, I would say 200 of our residents have recovered, and even that is a process. So in the end, we are expected to monitor the patterns of what we're seeing, report out, daily on what we're seeing in terms of the case counts, trying to synchronize and translate some of the guidance that we receive from our state and level partners. Um, so in the end, we depend on the partnership. You've already heard a couple of examples. We're trying to make sure that on the ground, we're keeping our ear to the ground by working with partners in the neighborhoods, but also making sure that we respond to the, the angst, the queries, the questions that residents and staff have. Um, so we're multitasking, we're nimble, uh, but in the end, we're all in this together, so we just got to figure out a way uh, to make sure that we can continue to respond to the needs of our residents. 
When, um, thank you. And thank you for the work that you're doing. Um, I, I just, you know, what we haven't mentioned is the incredible innovation around testing that our public health department is leading. We are to, we, we quickly, you know, before the state even moved forward, you uh, were able to help lead a, uh, the ability for us to test all of our nursing homes, our congregate care facilities, and you're now in the process of testing, you know, our senior buildings and, um, and, and targeting public housing um, communities as well. So thank you for that. And it's gonna be more of that. Um, Representative Ferranti, I, I know that you have to go. Um, so I have more questions for the other panels, but before you go, I would just say, um, has there been further conversation about whether or not this advisory board is gonna come back together? Do you see that there's like a phase two? And if so, would it be the same makeup? Um, and I suppose the legislature, we can, we, we can decide for ourselves as well, you know, what our own advisory committee looks like from here on. But um, just in terms of what testing and PPE looks like for businesses as people are gonna need more of that in order to meet the guidelines and the criteria that's been laid out as well. Yeah, so I do think um, the governor has reserved the right to call the advisory board back as the first phase opens. And, you know, just a couple of things that I, I wanna mention, and this is not in defense of the administration, this is just as an observer uh, to the process. But, you know, I think when I hear uh, Lou Di Pasquale talk, great, great Italian name, Lou, I love it. I knew that would connection would be good. When I hear uh, Lou Di Pasquale, <laughs> you know, it, it's one of the things that I would suggest to the viewers is that all the way around, whether you're a state rep, whether you're a town manager, whether you're the governor, nobody's done this before. And so, I know the group struggled with some of its uh, decisions and their discussions and, and how they came to various conclusions. Um, but I just wanna say there was no playbook for, um, for those that uh, participated to follow, to say, oh, this is the textbook and let's follow you know, chapter one through chapter nine and do this. And likewise, you know, for Lou, he has a really tough job here because he has to implement it on the city level. And, and my mayor, is a, she has a, a new motto now, and her motto is, um, we're all in the same storm, we're in the storm together, but we're not necessarily in the same size boat. And so I think it's something to recognize because each area is gonna have different concerns. There are some things that are gonna go really well for some communities and not go well for others. And in the, the areas where things didn't go as well uh, for them, Another community may have those challenges where some things were easy to implement. So I, you know, I feel it's, it's necessary as a legislator and somebody who observed the process to make sure we're constantly, whether it's through legislative oversight, uh, whether it's through observation and, and review. And I would encourage the audience to uh, email us with things that they're noticing and experiencing them because there has to, at every stage in this process be review. And um, I'm, uh, you know, uh, my dad was a, a fisherman and a laborer and, and uh, a machinist. He went through a couple of different um, occupations through his lifetime for, for various reasons. And it's really a, a special time, I think, where the essential workers in some instances are, the lower paid workers, which sometimes get overlooked in society, right? And so now when we see those folks that are responsible for sanitation, when we see folks who are responsible uh, for making sure the groceries are out there in the morning, right? I always joke in my community, because we're a fishing community, that somehow people think that there's magic fairy dust over the grocery stores and the groceries just appear there in the morning, right? But now, we're really given value to every stage of the economic ladder. And I think it's important that we continue to do that so that at every level, whether you're a small business owner and you're afraid you're gonna lose your business, whether you're an essential worker and you're afraid that you know your life might be compromised if we move too quickly, that we take all of this, or whether you're a consumer, you know, when food is essential. Lou and I are Italian. If we don't have a stocked refrigerator and freezer, there's something wrong with our day. And if we hear somebody in the neighborhood doesn't have enough food, we're really upset because we wanna make sure everybody's eating and eating and eating some more because we're Italian and that's how we function. And so it's important to make sure 
that societies work in, people are protected and, and people can survive this. And the only way we're going to do that well is to continue to be uh, vigilant as lawmakers and to make sure that as we go through this process that nobody's gone through before, that we're constantly changing, improving, and evolving the model so that we get the best for the people that we represent. So, so articulate and, and so smart and thoughtful, um, and I miss you. So miss it's you. nice to see you. Um, and I know that you have to run, but I really, I'm so grateful for your leadership and your thoughtfulness and knowing that we are going to make sure that as we move forward, it's going to be informed, yes. inv informed by those who, um, by, by those who have the most to risk and the most to lose. And I think you pointed out that those really right now, we're talking about the essential workers um, who continue, who've lost, I think the most out of any workforce. Um, and so our job at this point is to have a proportional response to their essentialness, to protecting them. So I know that you have to go, we're gonna keep the conversation going and um, be safe. And I look forward to talking to you again. Be safe, and I look forward to working with you closely on these issues to make sure we get the best for the Commonwealth. So thank, thank you, you. Thank you, especially in the mental health field. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Audrey, can I follow up on one point that was just made? Yep. So on the city side, when you think of essential workers, everyone thinks of police and fire, and they've done a phenomenal mm -hmm. job in emergency communications. But last Monday night, we presented what our public works employees have been doing and our human mm -hmm. services employees. And for most part, most people may not consider them as essential, but when you hear what those departments are doing and what those employees are doing, it brings a whole new meaning to essential. And I think that so much is going on in cities and towns where people hear essential, but don't realize how big essential really has become in this time frame. And it's just important to give the employees who've been nonstop a plug here because it's been that way. It's not just police and fire who've been great, but essential in an area of crisis like this becomes a whole lot bigger than people think. Louie, I want to thank you. Um, I'll just say, I have some, I'm going to go through some questions here quickly because you have a lot of questions. I will just tell you, I will have a, I, I will always think of a memorable conversation I had with a constituent who may or may not be watching this. And this person was a doctor and we had one of our worst snowstorms. And this person lived on a private road where you know, in exchange for living on a private road, which there are not a lot of them in Cambridge, you also don't have the city plowing your streets and was you know, demanding that it get plowed right now because this person was a doctor. And I said, I understand that you're an essential. I said, but so are the custodians. Um, and we had this conversation about like, and this was 10 years ago, eight years ago. Um, and I said, you know, if, if our custodians can't get to a hospital, you can't do your work. So we've got to figure this out for everybody at the hospital. So you know that my understanding of who's essential and your understanding of who's essential is going to be what drives our review of this. Um, I have some questions that I just will throw out there that people really want to know. Um, one of the questions are, um, if people are afraid to go to work and um, they either don't have childcare or they are just afraid of not being safe, um, what are the protections that are available to them, Jody? And will they still be able to collect unemployment? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so it is our understanding and um, really, I think, looking to folks at the Attorney General's office and um, Greater Boston Legal Services and others for, for details on this, that if you are someone in a high risk category, you do have some options to make, be able to con continue unemployment if you don't feel comfortable going to work. And in fact, the governor's plan does say those in high risk categories should stay home, but again, doesn't say how and what way they will be supported and whether or not their job will be retained for them when they can return. So there's there's another glaring omission that we were really concerned about. Um, we believe through American with Disabilities Act, those folks are able to access unemployment. If you simply are afraid to go to work and believe that your employer is not following the guidelines, you don't have a lot of options and don't have a lot of rights, which is really um, concerning. If, however, with these new standards in place, with the new complaint form that the Attorney General has out, workers who are concerned and don't believe that their employee employers are following the guidelines should make a complaint. Um, that should bring the Department of Labor Standards or local boards of health to the table to begin to interact. Uh, but um, 
but it is, it's very concerning. And um, there are not a lot of options to continue. Uh, you can have a conversation with your employer uh, about your concerns, but that doesn't guarantee access to unemployment if your job's been made available to you. Yeah, and, and that's why getting it right for who's risking their lives and going to work is gonna be really important. And, um, you know, I know that there were a handful of legislators who opposed the governor's reopening before we had the details. I, I was not one of them because I thought it was really important to understand what, what is this plan. Um, we need to be informed and then we need to figure out how is it, who's, who's informing this plan and, and how do we reopen safely? So I, I'm at that place where now is the time that we are asking these questions and that we will legislatively try to understand, you know, whether or not what we say we're going to do in the opening up is something that we actually can do. Because ultimately we do have a responsibility in a pandemic to protect the lives of, of all of our citizens. Um, I would say- I'm sorry, uh, can I add a the question about childcare, which is really important yeah, also. That's on here. <laughs> a lot of people are concerned about their ability to go back to work with lack of childcare. I mean, obviously we are waiting to see what that process will look like, but assuming you don't have childcare, the eight, you have, the uh, expanded paid family medical leave, which I think is critical, but it's 12 weeks and we're at not week nine. Okay. <laughs> so what's gonna happen after that? And it's also really important to point out that there are many workers who don't have access to those federal benefits and that I know the legislature is working on potentially expanding benefits through a state program for those who are undocumented or others who are working and need access to some of those paid family medical leave and, and paid sick time. We're gonna to have to figure that out. I mean, for me, the most painful irony of this is that those who we now see as essential collectively, um, our response has not been proportionate in, in understanding the urgency of what they need to be sick, to be healthy and to stay home and to care for their loved ones without risking their lives and without risking everyone else's lives. And if we don't want to respond to the most vulnerable people in our community as a human rights response, it now has to be a public health response that is directly tied to ensuring worker safety. Um, and so we are, um, you know, here, hold on tight. We're still, and I know this is hard for everybody and I'm gonna say, we're still at the beginning of this and that can feel really hard. And I can tell you, it felt really hard for me on Monday morning. I, I think I hit my wall really for the first time uh, in, in 10 or 11 weeks, um, but we're gonna do this together and we're gonna do it safely. And that's how, if we are patient, if we universally follow the rules here that are being laid and directed by the public health, right? Universally, that means that you're not the exception. What you're doing is about modeling good behaviors and good practices for everyone else. Claude, do we have enough testing in the process to open up the economy? What does it mean to actually have this phasing open of the economy? Because there's no deadlines, because it's supposed to be really, the triggers are supposed to be public health led. But do we have enough testing to even start to do what we said we, we hope to do or what the advisory board has hoped to do? Um, thank you for that question. I can share with you from the vantage point of what we're doing on the ground. So we have leaned in over the last five weeks doing testing, not only in the nursing homes, but the area homeless shelters. As of this week, we've stood up a mobile testing site in the Port neighborhood, which is one of the hotspots here. But really that was made possible because we have a strong partnership with the Broad Institute down the street. Plus, we had the labor, the, the swabbers, uh, the testers of record are the ambulance service, and now we've deputized our partners at the fire department. So I say that to say that it's the complement of having the testing kits. We have access, uh, but we know that that's not even across the Commonwealth. And so I would just, it makes the point, it's, it was designed to be an early warning system. That's why we did this pilot, and now we've seen that replicated across the Commonwealth in a number of communities. So. I can tell you what we have here in Cambridge. I know that there's a need for more. We're trying to incentivize and make sure that folks know there's an opportunity. Besides the East Cambridge testing tent, we now have the port project that's gonna be running for the next couple of weeks. Plus we're in a senior building. So again, we're a little biased in our ability here only because we're benefiting from the strong, robust partnerships. And it's an opportunity to model this. That's, that's what I would say is that it's given us a better gauge of what we're seeing on the ground. Uh, but to the other comments, I got to tell you, we're already seeing the unevenness. We could tell you what the healthcare workers in the nursing homes, what their plight has been. Uh, we can tell you what we're seeing with the, the, the shelter providers and what their plight has been for the last couple of months. So that's a window into what we should have in place 
to help support the folks on the ground. And I do appreciate the city manager's comment about the non-traditional first responders. Yes, custodians, uh, all the service providers, not just the healthcare providers, but uh, those, those, the burial, those processing burial permits, uh, or actually digging, the, sadly, the graves, because we've had a number of them that we've had to take care of here in the city. So all that to say, we are fortunate, yet we don't have enough on the ground, and we're open to seeing more testing kits being made available across the Commonwealth. Thank you. So, Louis, what happens, you know, one of the issues that we're, that businesses are going to face is their ability to open safely and have enough PPE, right? Who knew the words PPE prior to this if you weren't working in, like, the hazardous ways? Not me, right? Personal protection of, uh, protective equipment. Now, I know that today um, there was a lot of talk publicly about what's happening with our medical professionals at the Cambridge Health Alliance, right? Uh, nurses are feeling the need to have more, not feeling wanting and, and deserving to have more PPE. I've been on the other side of this working hand in hand with the hospital. People don't necessarily all know this, but for those watching, I've been working, and you know this, I've been working like this with the CHA for the last 11 weeks and working the phones to get desperately more PPE because the hospital has not had enough PPE. We've had shipments that have been halved. We've had shipments that have been diverted to other for-profit healthcare institutes when that was coming our way. So this is a real problem. And what um, a friend of mine said, you know, the real issue, he said this four weeks ago, the real issue is going to be when the businesses start competing with our hospitals for PPE, when we know that our hospitals are desperately in need of more PPE right now. So what does this look like for you as a city manager when businesses start to open and then you're left to enforce them about having more PPE? Do you shut them down? And have you been given directives about how to do that from the state? Well, from, from our point of view, we have given out on masks alone probably 30,000 to date. Uh, we've been really aggressive in terms of providing masks. It started with, you know, our business communities, they were open, supermarkets, restaurants, and we made sure that they had masks for all their employees. Then, of course, the, the employees that were in here. And then when we put the face guard uh, institute, the mandatory that people wore it, we had our police department in one week give out 12,000 masks to residents in the city and again, working with businesses. So we have an all points bolt and out for masks. We will continue. Uh, when we met with the faith community today, one of their first questions were, how are we gonna have masks for when people come in? So we're committed to try to work with them as well, but there's only so much the city's gonna be able to do. And it, it is, it's gonna almost become a competition of who can get it first, who gets it over, who doesn't get it. And it's, it's serious in terms of how those decisions are made. Fortunately for us right now, we've been able to keep up with that pace. But as the demand gets bigger and bigger, and the role of the city is to help and support. We could easily say, well, wait a second, that's on the business, that's on this. But we've not taken that approach. We've said we want to be partners with you. And like I said, we've really got the inspectional services department when we talk about non-essential, essential, their work in terms of dealing with supermarkets and restaurants to making sure that their employees had the masks they needed, that we provided was unbelievable. And it continues to be that way. And, you know, we've committed to the faith community. We're going to do everything we can to get them masks. And we're going to be probably working the same way when restaurants come back. What can we do to help? But I, I, had someone today, we're coming back June 1st. I got to make sure I got enough masks for city employees when they come back. So it, it is a balancing act. Uh, but I got to say that our purchasing agent and our police commissioner and fire chief have led the charge to try to find masks in the mayor has been instrumental. And obviously state representative Decker has been a big plus too. So we have been able to do it and Claude and the health departments do it. But as we get more and more open, masks are going to become a hotter and hotter thing to get and how that plays out is going to be real important. I mean, we're closing Memorial Drive for the first time this weekend, and we're going to have the police department out there giving out masks because, you know, we put a thing that said we're going to find $300 if you don't have a mask on. That is not the goal to give anyone a fine. Our goal is to make people understand the importance and give out masks, but sooner or later, we're going to run out of them, and that's going to be a problem when that occurs. Thank you, Louis. And again, I just go back to the fact that we're a community that at this time has had a lot of resources. That is just what we're talking about and we've been able to do. 
has not been the case for so many people across Massachusetts and neighbors that are just right next door to us. Um, and I think of communities where the higher number of essential workers who are immigrants, who are low income, um, and who don't have communities um, that they can't afford to live in this community, right? So um, they don't have access to communities that are able to buy and purchase that, that kind of PPE. And I worry about that. Uh, Jody, what is your advice to small businesses who are trying to come up with a plan about, um, you know, small businesses want to want to protect their employees often, right? These are people that they're close to and that they know that their business is only as good as those who work for them and care deeply about them. What's your advice and where should they be turning to right now for support? Yeah, I mean, I think that they're ever, for every small business and every business, what we recommend is doing what a hazard assessment, look at their business and try to identify how it is their workers and their customers can be exposed to the virus, which happens in three ways, large droplets, aerosol droplets and surfaces. And then you wanna find ways to protect your workers from those three points of exposure. PPE plays a role, but there are other things like ventilation and hygiene and sanitation and disinfection. All of those are gonna be really, really critical. And I understand access to PPE is really hard, but it is hard for me to understand that we live in the United States in 2020, and that we cannot get the personal protective equipment that we need. It's very hard for me to comprehend that, that, that we are fighting over personal protective equipment. Um, and one of the things that is very troubling is that the governor's plan does require employees to wear face coverings, but doesn't require employers to provide them. And for some people, that is going to be okay. They'll make their fabric masks. They'll take care of that. For other workers, that is not going to be an option. So, so we do have to figure that out. And I think small businesses, many of them, the line between employee and employer is very small. And they are working, they're on the floor. They want to protect themselves as well. They need that technical assistance and support. Ideally, the state would be providing those resources to either through either the state or additional resources and capacity to local boards of health to provide technical and compliance assistance to small businesses so that they can do what they want to be doing to protect their workers. Um, and yeah, I think it's the PPE question is going to be a really important one as we move forward. And I think MEMA has a play a role to play. Um, but yes, to see that healthcare workers are not getting what they need um, as really an indication that we will be in trouble as we phase in additional workers if we can't figure this out. Um, well, I mean, I, I think we're all, it's a national disgrace, right? That, that our hospitals are risking their, our people who are working in hospitals from cleaning the hospitals to providing care to patients are risking their lives. And, and some we know have died because um, our government and predominantly our national government has not found a way to get them what they need um, or has decided not to get them what they need. A little bit of both, I think. Um, but, and again, it makes me feel really grateful to live in a state like Massachusetts and to live in Cambridge, but it's never enough. Um, I, I do think this opening up, people continue to have more questions about this. If somebody has a complaint about um, either that they're concerned as, in a, as a worker that they, we're gonna make sure that they have the access to information through the Attorney General's complaint form. Um, Louis, is there a plan to continue to educate the public with both a complaint number for um, both uh, people who are workers as well as um, consumers? I, I can see, what I, what I have seen over the last couple of weeks is, you know, we've talked about this quarantine fatigue and I've been in my role as a chair of the Committee on Mental Health, I talk about this mental health surge that we're preparing for, and I'm seeing it. I'm seeing people come to their breaking point right now and really clear communication with resources about where to go if you have questions is going to be essential in helping to, I think, release some of that tension. Um, so is there a plan to have a more robust public health education campaign about what opening up the economy means in Cambridge and where people should go if they have questions or complaints? Uh, that's a great question. We actually had a live meeting on that today. Uh, David Kale, who's the assistant city manager for finance, is actually going to be the point person for the city to evaluate as the governor comes up with these more and more openings, what it means, how do we get people to be notified, who's the point of contact, is there going to be a number, what do we put on our website? Because, right, more and more information needs to be out there. And 
the one thing is even for a city, if you get a call, there's so many potential departments, you, you may think that's the department, but you wanna give that person the right information. So we're, what we've done now is we've kind of listed all the areas that the governor has talked about. And we're literally saying this would be the department, this would be the number. So that we're gonna have that out there. So if you look and say, I got a question on that, it's gonna give you a contact department, a name and everybody, because the one thing people don't need to be is transferred to two to three to four numbers, because you're really not, you're trying, but you're not positive. Because some of these areas are, is it the inspectional services? Is it the license? It's a public work. So we're putting that together, but that's so important because people are gonna be nervous, they're gonna be frustrated. And the last thing we need to be is an obstacle. We wanna be able to help them. So we're gonna get ahead of that in uh, David working with Lee Gianetti, who is our public relations information manager, are working on something. So it's gonna be trying to make it as easy as for our residents as possible to have questions answered online and with numbers that they can reach out to. I think, thank you. That's gonna be really important. Um, Claude, did you wanna add something? Yeah, just your comment about um, mental health, just knowing that May is Mental Health Awareness Month. So we've tried to lean in to make resources more available. We have frank conversations with our own staff and we would encourage folks, you talked about quarantine fatigue. COVID fatigue is, is alive and well and real. And so we are early in this ball game, barely the third inning by my count, but just thinking about what else we need to have out there. So we are pushing information so that resources are made available to folks recognizing the role that employee assistance programs or, or just being able to connect. So acknowledging your point and we're paying just as much attention to positivity counts as well as just paying attention to how folks really need to feel supported in their times of duress. So point well taken, but just acknowledging that. No, thank you, Claude. I think a few things as we wrap up here, um, you know, we have more questions. People are asking, what does travel look like? What does tourism look like? When can they actually, what is a, a physical distance um, visit look like? Is that safe? And what I will say, there's gonna be a lot of questions that you have. Um, I, I guess what I would ask us to all keep in mind is that it's gonna require us to be more patient than we've ever wanted to be, or that feels even possible. Um, it is going to be the science and, and the public health information that's going to drive this. Um, you know, I, I talked to someone who I love very much, which some of, some of you will recognize, and I'm sure she's watching this right now. And her response was, I can't wait till Monday. And this woman's grandson said, what do you mean, Nana? What does Monday mean? Well, that means we can go out again. And we had to remind this very special woman that the, the virus doesn't go away on Monday. Um, and really, and I think that that's the messaging that has to get through. This, is, this was an advisory group that I will say was not perfect by any means and really missed an opportunity by having um, worker representatives there. But this is an advisory group that I think has done a lot of work and they are really working hard as, as all of us are to figure out what are the safe ways to reopen parts of our lives, knowing the risk that we have is also a complete collapse of our economy, which also will have as much tragedy at the end. But that science and public health has to actually drive that. And I have been reading a lot, as many of you have, and I believe it's possible to do both, but we've got to do both. Um, and they have to be hand in hand, and that's gonna require patience. So if you're asking what can you do, I encourage you to ask questions call my office, call the public health department, call the manager. It's going to be science that drives this. So keeping at a minimum, I wanna be also clear, six feet is the minimum. When I hear six feet, I just think epidemiologists talk about between six to 12 to 15 feet. And if you're in enclosed structures, um, six feet with somebody who's infected, who you do not, you, who you're in, who's infected, that's a very different six feet than being outside. Assume everyone outside of your house is infected understand what that distance really means. It's a it's a, a, a recommendation. It's not a guarantee. Face coverings are how we protect each other. So if you choose to make yourself the exception, not for a medical issue, but just to be the exception, recognize you're asking everyone else to protect you, but you're saying to them, I'm not willing to protect you. This is universal. Um, and that we are going to have to really continue to reimagine how to safely go on with our lives um, and not overwhelm our hospitals, not overwhelm our medical staff, not overwhelm our essential workers, while also reimagining essential workers 
are the lowest paid workers for those who aren't directly health care providers and scientists. And our response has not been proportional. We have been having an epic failure when it has come to making sure that those who must work, right? We, we talk about them being heroes. There are people who are trying to feed their families, which is why they're putting themselves at risk. And we must do everything we can in a way we never have to recognize that by providing them the resources and the legal protections to protect themselves, protect their families. And so I continue to do that work as well. I feel fortunate to live in a city and to work with, with people like Jody from Mascosh, who are so focused on making sure that as we open in the economy, it's not at the expense of those who are actually making it possible. Without them, there is no economy. Um, and without doing this safely, we will never get out of this. But I believe we can and we will. And um, I, I'm so grateful to just be in this with all of you here who are my guests and to all of you in Cambridge and anywhere else. I wish you, the, 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 I wish you wellness, I wish you safety and um, ask questions and reach out for help when you need more answers and clarification. I wanna say thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Manager. Thank you, Commissioner. And, and thank you, Jody. Thank you for your work um, on behalf of workers around the state. Thank, thank you. you thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.